Well, Gamecock fans, it's time that I talk about the elephant in the room. Or in this case, the Rattler in the room. That is Spencer Rattler. Our Locked On Gamecocks, your daily podcast on the South Carolina Gamecocks. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Hello, Gamecock Nation, and welcome back to another episode of the Locked On Gamecocks podcast, your show for daily Gamecock headlines and potential storylines on your favorite South Carolina sports teams. I'm your host, as always, Andrew Lyon, and as mentioned in the opening, I'm going to be talking about Spencer Rattler for today's show. I'm going to look at both the good and the bad that took place in the first two seasons of Spencer Rattler's collegiate career, going over some of his stats, a couple of specific games, and some of the strengths and weaknesses that I noticed after having watched film from six different games for today's episode. In the second segment of today's show, I'm going to try and figure out what went wrong with Spencer Rattler, why things sort of took a turn for the worse in his sophomore campaign, and just how much of it was truly on Spencer Rattler. And then at the end of today's show, I will discuss what Spencer Rattler's impact has been already at South Carolina and what it could be for this upcoming season. But before I do all of that, as always, thank you for making the Locked On Gamecocks podcast your daily choice for South Carolina Gamecocks sports coverage. Okay. So, in order to sort of get an idea of why there's so much talk about Spencer Rattler in the world of college football, we have to remember just how highly touted of a prospect Spencer Rattler was coming out of high school. As Spencer Rattler, according to 24-7 Sports Composite Rankings, was listed as the 11th best prospect nationally, the best pro-style quarterback in the country, the best player out of the state of Arizona, and a five-star. He, of course, would commit to play at Oklahoma, and in 2019, he would sit his freshman year redshirting as he would learn behind former quarterback Jalen Hurts, who had played at Alabama, was, of course, replaced by Tua Tagovailoa, and then would later transfer to Oklahoma for his final year of college football. Now, looking at his freshman campaign, of course, there's a lot of good reason as to why Spencer Rattler was so highly touted coming into the 2021 football season. As in 2020, Spencer Rattler had a 67.5% completion percentage, threw for 3,031 passing yards, threw 28 passing touchdowns, 7 interceptions, and added 160 rushing yards and 6 rushing touchdowns. Now, between that and part of his 2021 campaign, in my opinion, Spencer Rattler's three best games in his career up to this point have been against Oklahoma and TCU at home in 2020 and against Kansas State on the road in 2021. And with all three of these games that, again, I watched the film earlier today, I noticed a few common things that Rattler was doing in each of these games which were leading to great success. One of his biggest strengths, in my opinion, that Rattler does not get enough credit for when people talk about him is his pocket presence. Both when to take off running and scramble to try to get some positive yards or whether or not he needs to maybe sit back and try to stay in the pocket a little bit longer and wait for a wide open receiver. I think that this honestly is one of the better traits in Spencer Rattler's game. And this also included being able to evade pressure. There was a lot of times where there was a couple of guys that maybe would blitz on a particular play on the defensive side. And one of the guys would either pretty much get around one of the offensive tackles or maybe a linebacker would just get through Scott Free up the middle. And Spencer Rattler had to make a quick move in order to be able to evade the oncoming blitzer. And... Spencer was able to do this at a very high clip, and there was very few times where the defender was actually able to just flat out corner Spencer Rattler with basically nowhere to run. He was also really good at throwing 
protective passes to receivers when defenders were nearby. What I mean by that is this. If, say, a receiver ran across the middle of the field on maybe like a simple drag route, and they end up stopping in the middle of the field, Rattler eventually throws them the ball, but he sees that a linebacker is close by. Rattler would always make sure to throw it right in the receiver's chest so that that way the defender could not easily maybe come up from behind and try to maybe overhand swipe and hit the ball out and force an incompletion, or maybe potentially have a chance to get both his hands in there and try to maybe wrangle the ball out for an interception. He was really good at this when it came to hitch and comeback routes. He was also very accurate when it came to one-cut routes. And with these kind of routes, I'm talking about slants, digs over the middle, in and out routes, post routes, and pretty much any one-cut routes that you can think of. Spencer Rattler, especially when it came to timing in the air raid offense under Lincoln Riley, his head coach, Rattler had to really learn how to get the timing down for all of these plays. And that's one of the big positives of the air raid offense. While the playbook might be very small in terms of the amount of plays that you're actually running or the amount of concepts that you're using, it forces guys to have to really hone in their execution of plays and practice. And one of the more important things when it comes to passing plays is the timing and synchronization between the quarterback and his wide receivers. Rattler was very good when it came to this on these one-cut routes. He was also very accurate on the run. You've probably heard this beaten like a dead horse, essentially, this offseason. But Spencer Rattler is almost kind of like a magician, when honestly, when he runs out of the pocket. Rattler is very good at being able to contort his body at what for many quarterbacks would be a very unorthodox angle and be able to get the ball out and somehow still get it in the receiver's vicinity and on certain occasions, quite honestly, throw it on the money like he was still standing back in the pocket. And he was also extremely good at running the read option, especially in his sophomore campaign, probably the later part of his freshman season. Rattler got really good at knowing when to give it to the running back and when to keep it and take off. And of course, Lincoln Riley very innovative with some of the read option plays that Oklahoma has in their playbook. But of course... It wasn't a happy ending for Spencer Rattler in Oklahoma. And when he went to his sophomore season, things would end up taking a downturn. In just a few moments, I'm going to mention his stat line from his sophomore season, talk about a couple of the worst games he had in his career, and some of the consistent things I noticed in each of those games. But before I do that, I have a quick word from our friends over at Built Bar. Now, if you're all like me, you have a hard time trying to find food that not only tastes good, but it's healthy for you to eat. Trust me, I know because I just went to the grocery store the other day, and it was difficult at times trying to find food that I knew would be better for me to eat. You know, like caramel chocolate brownies. Okay, but seriously, what if I told you that you could have that brownie plus 17 grams of protein? Yes, that's right. You're in luck because caramel brownie bars are available at Built.com right now, but you gotta act fast before they're out of stock. These bars will help solve your problem trying to find that tasty post-workout snack. Plus, the macronutrient counts are unreal. 130 calories, 17 grams of protein, and only 4 grams of sugar. But the best part is caramel brownie bars are covered in 100% real chocolate. There's a big misconception in the world of fitness and nutrition that in order to meet your goals, you have to sacrifice taste. But with Built Bar, you don't have to sacrifice taste to be healthy. You can have the best of both worlds, and all Built Bars are made with collagen protein, which your body absorbs more efficiently and provides tons of health benefits. There are a million reasons that you should try Built Bars, and having caramel brownie bars are just another reason why. With Built, tasty is the new healthy. So go to Built.com right now to get your box of caramel brownie bars today. And if you're looking to save money, we've got you covered there as well. When you go to Built.com, use the promo code LOCKED15 and get 15% off your order. That's LOCKED in all caps, 15 at the end, for 15% off at Built.com. Go right now while the offer lasts. Okay, so now let's look at Spencer Rattler's 2021 season. So his final stat line for 2021 was a 74.9% completion percentage. Throwing for 1,483 passing yards, 11 passing touchdowns, 5 interceptions, rushing for 77 yards, and scoring 3 touchdowns on the ground. Now, 
When looking at Spencer Rattler's three worst games in his career, I picked out one from the 2020 season and two from 2021. The first one being in 2020 versus Kansas. And at first, I was going to talk about this more in depth, but as I continued to watch the game, I realized that Spencer Rattler was dinged up in this game. And also, quite frankly, a lot of the incompletions that he had from that game I believe he completed about 54% of his passes, which was extremely low compared to his career average. A lot of those incompletions were on the wide receiver, so I decided not to talk about that game because I felt like it would be very unfair to judge him on that one performance. So instead, I looked at the West Virginia and Texas games from last season. Starting off with West Virginia, Spencer Rattler very clearly was a little bit rattled by the Mountaineer defense. Having a lot of missed throws, both from an accuracy standpoint and, quite frankly, from an arm strength standpoint. Having some underthrows, which led to West Virginia defenders being able to get back into a play, despite the fact that his receivers were starting out with like a two to three step advantage when the ball was coming out of Spencer Rattler's hands. And this happened on multiple occasions with receivers like Mike Woods, Jadon Hazelwood, and Marvin Mims. And then the Texas game. Everything just kind of bottomed out. He had some missed throws with Drake Stoops. He threw an interception early in the game that quite literally had no sooner receiver in the vicinity and went straight to a Longhorn defender. He overthrew Mike Woods on the sideline when trying to move out of the pocket. He had an occasion or two where he held on to the ball too long in the pocket, which led to a sack. He even started to miss some wide open hitches and other routes, which was just very uncharacteristic of Spencer Rattler. To top off his performance in the Texas game, the final play that Rattler was in the game, he tried to get out of the backfield because of a bunch of pressure that came up the middle, compressing the middle part of the pocket, but he basically carried the ball like a loaf of bread, and when he took off to the left side of the offensive line, he was hit from a defender, and the ball was knocked out, and it was a fumble recovered by the Texas Longhorns, and after that, of course, Caleb Williams would take over for Spencer Rattler, and the rest was history for the 2021 season for Spencer Rattler and the Oklahoma Sooners. Now, based on what I saw from Three's games, there was a couple of different things that I think that Spencer Rattler needs to improve. Some mechanics with his release point would definitely be one thing, and admittedly, I did not play offense when I was in high school, I played defensive line, so I'll be completely honest. I really could not tell you where to start when it comes to mechanics with his release point, but I can tell you this much. I think his release point definitely was probably a little bit too affected by some of these other things that I'm going to discuss in just a second. He did not do a good enough job, in my opinion, of using his lower body power into his throws. In his freshman year, Spencer Rattler was very bad about staying on his tiptoes when he was sitting back in the pocket looking to throw the ball. And when you think about it, when you're staying on your tiptoes and you've got something like a football or a baseball, when eventually you throw that ball, if you stay on your tiptoes, you're going to have a higher apex or a higher release point when you're letting go of the ball. And if that is the case, that can essentially cause the ball to flutter a little bit more and maybe stay in the air a little bit longer. And of course, when you do that, that allows defenders in the case of a football game to be able to recover any lost ground against their man, be able to maybe get their hand in and deflect the ball, or the worst case scenario, be able to get in there and get an interception. Now, in his sophomore season, Spencer Rattler did a better job of not staying on his tiptoes the entire time he was sitting in the pocket, but he still would not step up in the pocket and throw the ball a little bit more on his front foot. He would basically be standing upright throwing the football, kind of like basically imagine if you're on the beach and you're just kind of casually throwing the football around with a buddy. That's basically how Spencer Rattler would throw the football. Now, obviously, he wasn't throwing it to where, like, you know, the ball would hang up for three seconds and whatnot. He was putting a little bit of gusto on it, but he would not use, again, any lower body power and transfer that energy all the way up into his throws from his shoulder all the way up into his hand when letting go of the football. 
basically, he was relying purely off of upper body torque forces. And while I'm not going to turn this podcast into a biomechanics class of any sort, the bottom line is this. Spencer Rattler left a lot of distance at times on some of his throws when he was in some of these ball games. And that would sometimes have a real negative result in the end. And another thing that could have caused Spencer Rattler to regress in his sophomore season is the fact that Rattler is known for having a quick release. And a lot of people commend him for how quick his release is because, of course, if you're a quarterback that can get the ball out fast, sort of like a Tom Brady, not comparing him to Tom Brady, but the point being, you don't, you rarely see Tom Brady take a sack when he's playing a game in the NFL. Kind of the same deal with Spencer Rattler. If you can get the ball out fast, then logic tells you that the defense is probably not going to be able to get to the quarterback very often or at the very least not be able to get any sacks. So this was more to his benefit early on in his college career, but in his sophomore season, it sort of became more of a detriment because of another factor that I'm going to discuss in just a couple of moments. But the good news from all of these things that I have mentioned is these are issues that can be fixed with some good coaching, some repetition, and what Rattler has already gotten by coming to South Carolina, a fresh start with a whole different set of expectations compared to following up three Heisman Trophy candidates slash winners at Oklahoma, which was big shoes to fill. And I think that people sort of forget that in regards to when Spencer Rattler was at Oklahoma starting out. Okay, now with Rattler's sophomore season, there's a narrative that has been created around Spencer Rattler that the reason he was benched was because he was holding back Oklahoma's offense. And there was a faction of the fan base for Oklahoma that definitely felt like that Spencer Rattler was not getting the job done, was not performing up to snuff, and they needed to make a change. And I think that there are a couple of truths to that, but there's also definitely some flaws with this narrative. I'm going to start out with the offensive line play for the Oklahoma Sooners in the 2021 season. Before I mention these stats, I want it to be known that I got a lot of these stats from a website called footballoutsiders.com doing a lot of analytical data with offensive line statistics. One of the best websites I can recommend if you're looking for something like that. So with Oklahoma's offensive line in 2021, their unadjusted sack rate, which was for all non-garbage time pass attempts, period, was 7.7%, which doesn't sound bad at first. Until I tell you that it ranked 92nd out of 130 FBS teams and second worst in the Big 12 behind West Virginia. This was up from 6.5% in the 2020 season. It gets worse from here. The adjusted sack rate for passing down pass attempts, basically meaning if it was like 2nd and 15 or 3rd and 18, obvious passing down. Some coaches would probably say, hey, I would run a halfback draw on that play, but more often than not, those are considered passing downs. That's what this statistic constitutes. And the percentage for this sack rate was 10.7%, which ranked 110th out of 130 FBS teams and the worst in the Big 12. And this was up from 6.9% in 2020, which ranked 42nd in the FBS, a very steep decline by the Sooners offensive line. Even Caleb Williams, who was a way better runner than Spencer Rattler, I don't think anybody's going to argue that point, was sacked 19 times in the six regular season games that he started after he took over in the Texas game last season. So when bearing all these statistics in mind, it's easy to see how Spencer Rattler could have started to prioritize maybe getting the ball even quicker in 2021, even if that meant it came at the expense of some of his accuracy when he was throwing the football. Listen, I don't care who you are playing quarterback. If your offensive line is having that much trouble blocking for you in the passing game, it will eventually start to sit in the back of your head. And it is going to constantly be a thought that comes up throughout football games, no matter how hard you try to block that out. And the craziest part about this for how much South Carolina's offensive line 
had really bad moments last season. Oklahoma gave up 33 sacks in 2021. That was actually two more than what South Carolina's offensive line gave up. And that was against SEC defenses. And again, with quarterbacks Jason Brown, Zeb Noland, Luke Doty, and Dakaron Joyner. Dakaron Joyner was for one game. Don't really count that. Luke Doty was playing with a broken bone in the middle of his foot. And Zeb Nolan, Jason Brown, no offense, they can't run around a football field like Caleb Williams can. Also, that was playing against the Clemson Tigers at the end of the year. So I understand that the difference in those two numbers are a little bit minute, but all these stats should at least dispel the notion that Rattler is joining a worse situation in regards to at least the offensive line. Another reason why Spencer Rattler probably gets a little bit too much flack for his play in 2021 is the Power 5 defenses he played. When Spencer Rattler was the starting quarterback and played the whole game against Power 5 competition in 2021, all of the defenses that he faced were ranked 45th or better nationally by the season's end when it came to scoring defense, meaning that they were above average to great. Now, I'm not saying that, of course, these defenses were like Georgia or Alabama. I'm definitely not saying that, but they were no slouches. Nebraska was ranked 36th in scoring defense nationally by the end of the season. West Virginia was ranked 45th in the country in scoring defense. Kansas State was ranked 23rd in the country, and they had to play against them on the road. And then you also look at the situation behind the scenes regarding the head coach's job status. Now, look, I obviously don't know what all went down with Lincoln Riley and Southern Cal. But I will say this, in all the years that I have watched college football and I have paid attention to the sport and how much I pay close attention to all these head coaches and where they could end up the next season, there is just no way that Lincoln Riley got a phone call after the Bedlam rivalry game against Oklahoma State from Southern Cal was offered the job and just all of a sudden spontaneously said, yep, I'm going to Southern Cal. I'm going to take their head coaching job. There's just no way that that was the case. You don't ever hear this kind of stuff happening in college football or really and truthfully any sport. It just doesn't happen that way. That's not how business is done. There had to have been some communication between Southern Cal and Lincoln Riley for at least a certain portion of the season. And of course, there's been a lot of rumors that have come out of Norman, Oklahoma, that they talked as early as like maybe week five or six in this season, maybe even earlier than that. It's, it's a lot to keep up with. And while I'm not trying to speculate on when all that took place and started, if this was indeed the case, I have to imagine that this had an impact on obviously on the locker room, but of course, especially the quarterbacks, because that was Lincoln Riley's position, and the offense is his baby. That is who he is mainly responsible for, for a play calling and technique perspective. So when you add in all of these factors together, my overall point is this. I'm not absolving Spencer Rattler completely for sort of the mistakes that were made, and of course, again, some of the regression that obviously took place in his sophomore campaign. But my point is, you cannot rest all of that on his shoulders. There was a lot of other things that happened or took place throughout the season that definitely could have compounded the issues there. Oh, and the guy that took over him was a former five-star quarterback in his own right. And to be honest with you, probably 98% of the quarterbacks in the FBS would probably get replaced by Caleb Williams in the exact same circumstances. So it's not like Spencer Rattler is the only guy that that could have happened to last season. All right, so for the final segment of today's show, I want to talk about the impact that Spencer Rattler has already had and the impact that he could have on this program in the future and this coming season. So, first of all, recruiting. Obviously, when Spencer Rattler and Austin Stogner both committed to South Carolina on the same night back in mid-December last year, it caught the college football world by storm. A lot of people did not see it coming. People were shocked when they saw that Spencer Rattler was coming to South Carolina. And a lot of people were merely joking, saying that, I thought that he was actually going to the other USC in Southern Cal. 
instead coming here. And when you have a guy of Spencer Rattler's caliber, a former five-star quarterback, considered to be one of the more talented passers of the football in the college game, that is going to catch other players' attention. And it makes people say, sit there and go, oh, if Spencer Rattler really likes South Carolina and what they're doing over there and really trust Shane Beamer that much to transfer from Oklahoma to South Carolina in the situation that he is in right now, maybe that's a place that I would like to go. And it's a definite eye-opener to other guys. As I've mentioned before, a lot of these guys talk more than you know, texting back and forth, calling one another. Spencer Rattler obviously playing college ball. It's not like that he's a four or five star recruit back in high school and he maybe can talk to other five star recruits. But the point being is either way, with all these kids being on social media these days and paying attention to stuff like this, this is something that's eye catching when an event like this occurs. The quarterback production. I probably don't need to spend a whole lot of time on this either way because this goes without saying. The quarterback production ceiling will be infinitely higher in, and the floor as well in 2022 compared to last year. The quarterback South Carolina had playing last year definitely tried as hard as they could and they all brought something to the table. Zeb Nolan, of course, tried to keep the ship guided straight ahead at the beginning of the year when Doty got hurt. Doty then came in and performed admirably despite having a broken bone in his foot when Zeb Nolan got a hand injury against the Georgia Bulldogs. Jason Brown did a great job helping the Gamecocks become bowl eligible late in the season when Doty had to be sidelined for the rest of the season and have surgery, and Zeb Nolan... Just quite frankly, it just wasn't providing enough of a spark for the offense when he was in the quarterback position. All these guys brought something. None of them are Spencer Rattler from an arm talent standpoint. It also gives Luke Doty a chance to develop. Luke Doty has been in such unfair situations the last two years. It is quite frankly absurd and ridiculous that some people are actually already writing him off. I remind you, this was a guy who was a top 250 prospect in his recruiting class for the 2020 cycle. Four-star dual threat quarterback. He went into the starting job in 2020 late in the season after Will Muschamp had been fired because, again, the offense literally could not do anything besides hand the ball to Kevin Harris and pray that he could carry them to victories. There was no quarterback production at that time. Last season, he played on a broken foot in an entirely new offense. He now actually gets a chance to sit back, develop, and learn from somebody who's had a lot of experiences, whether it's good or bad, in Spencer Rattler. And I think that could be greatly beneficial to Luke Doty. And then the last thing is, again, an obvious point, but it cannot be overstated. This is a chance for Spencer Rattler and the South Carolina program as a whole to change their perception. There are a lot of fans that are still questioning just how good South Carolina can do this next season. There are a lot of people that still question whether or not Shane Beaver is going to work out as South Carolina's head coach long term. And while that might sound crazy to South Carolina fans right now to hear those words come out of anybody's mouth, the truth is, quite frankly, until South Carolina goes out there and can back up all the hype that they have had this offseason, a lot of people nationally that have not paid attention to this conference or at least this team well enough, they're going to continue to have this same trait of thought. And so Spencer Rattler coming here, he can not only repair, I guess, his image, even though some of that stuff was a bit overblown from his time at Oklahoma, but he can also help South Carolina really step foot back on the national scene in the sport of college football. So obviously a lot of stuff that Spencer Rattler has a hand in right now and could have a hand in this coming season in regards to positive change, both, again, for himself and his career and the South Carolina football program. So what do you guys think about Spencer Rattler? Do you think that maybe there's some other reasons as to why things didn't work out Oklahoma that I did not mention in this video? What do you think Spencer Rattler is going to do for South Carolina 2022? Do you think that Spencer Rattler could maybe, you know, lead South Carolina to 7-8 wins? What do you think is going to happen? I want to know your thoughts in the comments down below or feel free to tweet at me on Twitter. You see my at down below. Either way, I want to know your thoughts about Spencer Rattler. Obviously, it's going to be really exciting for South Carolina to be able to buckle up this next season and see where Spencer Rattler could take this South Carolina 
offense and the football team as a whole. So thank you all once again for watching. Hope you all have a great rest of your Wednesday. I'll catch you all on the next show of the Locked On Gamecocks podcast.